we have seen to an extent this morning the the heart of god how good and how loving and how forbearing he is we read in matthew 20 verse 25 onwards brother read jesus said here in the world the rulers of the gentiles lord over it and their great men exercise authority over them but it is not so among you but you but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant you want to be great be a servant and whoever wishes to be first be a slave you see the stages there you want to be great be a servant a paid servant servant is always paid and you want to be first be a slave slave is not paid slave is a bond slave that you bought with a price and he or she has to remain with you for life that's the difference between a servant and a slave and just as the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many we know jesus how many times he served his disciples we read in the next chapter 21 verse 18 jesus was going in the morning it says that he became hungry matthew 21 18 and then he goes to the fig tree to eat and he doesn't find any uh, figs there you know i was thinking about this how is it that only jesus was hungry it never says that the disciples were also hungry i have a feeling that probably jesus served the breakfast to the disciples and probably there was nothing left for him and he said okay we'll we'll go and they were going to the city and he became hungry on the way you see in the old testament we read god the father giving them manna every day from heaven and provided quails and provided fresh water from the rock and but jesus didn't do that for his disciples when they were hungry we read in chapter 4 of john at the well of jacob he was hungry the disciples went to eat and then they brought food for jesus why didn't jesus make a miracle and and just like that get some food for them he could have done that satan tempted him and said why don't you turn these stones into bread he didn't do that he never used his um, i mean his prerogatives and his uh, uh, you know power to fulfill his own uh, requirements and the requirements of his disciples they worked and they ate and uh, you know this is how jesus served them even in on, in the last supper on in uh, matthew uh, john 13 we read that jesus before he served food and wine to them he washed their feet and then he served them even after the resurrection you look at jesus in john was um, 21 verse 12 i think it says jesus says come and have breakfast the previous verse it says there was hot coal on which bread and fire was there and he cooked for them and he called them for you see all his life jesus served his disciples he said i never came to be served but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many why do we want to be served because of one thing selfishness i think i am somebody great in galatians 6 it says he who thinks he is somebody when he is nobody it says that means basically we are all nobodies but we think we are somebodies that's why we have demands we expect this and we expect that from one another when you have expectations then you will be disappointed when it is not met when you don't have expectations whether it is met if it is met you will be thankful if it is not met you are not bothered you see we always live in a kind of pyramid all selfish people a pyramid i me mine 
myself. It's always like that. When I have that kind of pyramid in my life, I always expect people to serve me. But when I do away with that and destroy that pyramid in my life and then others come first for me. You see, Jesus said about... Um, he, he told uh, this thing in uh, Luke 17. Luke 17 verse 10, he says here, he says about a servant, but uh, which of you, verse 7, having a slave plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come home from the field, come immediately and sit down and eat? No master says that to the servant when he comes back home after working in the field. He says, but... Uh, he says he will say to him, prepare something for me to eat first and properly clothe yourself and serve me until I have eaten and drunk and afterward you eat and you drink. He does not thank the slave because he did this thing which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all these things which are commanded you, say we are unworthy slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. I remember once, more than 10, 12 years ago in my office, once I told an uh, office cleaning lady to uh, deposit a check in the bank which was next door. She went and deposited and came back and gave me the counterfoil and I said thank you to her. And immediately she shot back at me and saying, why do you thank me sir, I'm only a servant. Then I said, shouldn't servants be thanked? You know, it spoke to me that day that the servants, especially the slaves, they never expect you to thank them. Do you thank them when your servant is going back after finishing all the work? Rarely. Some out of maybe courtesy they do. But generally people don't thank the servant and I learned something there. The servants don't expect to be thanked. Even if you thank, they feel sort of you know, embarrassed because they say it is my duty to do. I was reading that in the original it says, uh, here it is euphemistically written here saying that unworthy slaves, but in the original it says we are useless and good for nothing slaves. Useless, think about it useless and good-for-nothing slaves and we have only done that which we should have done. In the original it says we have done or we have repaid our debt what we should have paid. That's all. Good-for-nothing and we have repaid our debts. Is there anything great in that uh, to glory in? You see when the prophet Elisha was called, you know the story. Elisha was plowing the field with 12 pairs of oxen. He had such a huge piece of land, not one or two or even, even half a dozen, one dozen pair of oxen he was using, a yoke of oxen, to plow his field. And he was the 12th one. He, even though he was such a rich man, he was working along with the servants. No wonder God called him. You know when God called him, what was his, this thing, how people recognized him? You turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 3. 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 23. No, I'm sorry. 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 11 last part of it. It, it says about Elisha, the son of Shaphat is here who used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. You know how he was known? He was known as a man who used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. And Elijah, when he went and threw his mantle on Elisha, you know, Elisha could have said, hey, what are you doing? Go from here. He didn't say that even though he was such a rich man 
he recognized what his calling was his calling was not to continue with this ancestral property but to leave that and go behind this man who is like a nomad he has no house no proper clothes and uh, he comes here and throws his uh, uh, mantle maybe it was some animal skin or probably a blanket or something and he recognizes that god is calling me for something higher and he he goes and he breaks the yoke and with that wood he uh, he cooks a meal cutting those oxen and throws a big party and then he comes and joins this man but what was he known as a man who was pouring water on elijah's hands probably when elijah went anywhere he used to first wash his hands and elisha used to be there to pour water on his hands then after elijah ate then again elisha would come and pour water on his hands that was his ministry that's all he was known as that you not he, he was not known as a rich young uh, you know real estate uh, owner or something like that people never rep- refer to him as that not even as a rich young ruler like we read in the new testament he was known as someone who just poured water on elijah's hands just think about that brothers and sisters a menial thing brought that man to a place where he could have the double portion of the spirit of elijah and he became that because of his attitude he humbled himself in such a way like a slave no wonder it says in philippians 2 that even jesus christ even though he existed in the form of god he humbled himself and took upon himself the form of a bond slave it says bond slaves are slaves for life you bought them and they are your property you can treat them anywhere you like anyhow you like you can kill them nobody will ask you why you killed because it's a property they were treated like furniture you know there's a verse in song of solomon verse 5 uh, chapter 5 verse 2 i think it says i was asleep but my spirit was awake I'll just think about that verse to live in such a way that even though when we are sleeping we, our spirit is awake we are tuned to our ears are attuned to heaven like samuel was sleeping and the lord called samuel samuel immediately got up and went and asked eli did you call me see to be like that to be always attentive to god and to listen to his voice and to listen to what he has to say even if it is a menial thing that i have to do the lord says i mean the lord gives grace to those who humble we heard if you want to be great be a servant if you want to be first be a slave what is the reason that i humble myself for do i humble myself so that one day i'll become great so that one day i'll become a leader is that my motive to serve one another many many serve like that i i okay i'll clean i'll start cleaning the toilet and sweeping the floor and mopping the one day i think the elders will recognize me and then you know they will ordain me as a deacon or an elder is that uh, my ulterior motive in serving and doing menial things or is it because i serve someone the king of kings and the lord of lords came down and became a slave and served me took my filth away washed me cleansed me and called me he was not ashamed to call me his son or his daughter what is it that i am aspiring for the basic necessities of a servant is humility and selflessness if i have humility and selflessness that is the basic requirement to be a servant if i don't have these two then i am only acting you know it is a it, it's an attitude it is not that it's not so much that i i do some service in in church and brothers and sisters if you are not cleaning your toilet at home if you are not sweeping and sawing and doing 
I mean, running errands for your parents. If you're not obeying your parents at home, don't come and do it here, please. You're doing it here only for honor seeking. Please resign from that post and give it to somebody else. Don't take that so called honor. It is honor seeking. You are not doing it as unto the Lord. You are doing it with an ulterior motive. You are not doing it first of all at home. And you want to come and do it here to get honor. You push somebody's you know, wheelchair so that others can see, oh what a humble brother and sister he is or she is. Why do you do that? So that others can see you and come and say thank you to you afterwards. Judge yourself. We all can judge ourselves. The Bible says, if we judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. Just think on the, on the final day when the, at the judgment seat of Christ, everybody is coming there and you are there and one is being judged and the Lord says, sees you, you come next and the Lord says, oh, not you, you go next. Because why? Because you judged yourself while you were on earth. You lived before God's face while you were on earth. Then there is no need. When we judge ourselves, we shall not be judged, it says. So when you have already done that job, then God will not have to judge you. Because it's the, the record is clean and clear. And the Lord will say, not you, 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 next. Think about that, brothers and sisters, to live in such a way that when my turn comes, the Lord has nothing in my in my record to say, judge me against. He says, okay, you're, you're all right, you go. You know, let's covet that. And one last verse in Luke 12. Luke 12, verse 37. It says, about being in readiness. Be dressed in readiness, verse 35, and keep your lamps alight. And be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master shall find on the alert. When he comes, truly I say to you, that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them. Think about that verse 37. Blessed are the slaves whom the master shall find on the alert when the master comes back. Truly I say to you that the master will gird himself like the servant or the servants and have the servants recline at the master's table and will come up and serve the slaves or the servants. Imagine this. The master, the lord, the king comes and finds his servants faithful. And what does he, how does he reward them? He rewards them by taking their clothes, putting on himself like Jesus wrapped a towel around him and took a basin and washed the disciples feet made them sit at the table and wash, it, wash their feet, Jesus, God will do exactly the same. On that day when he sees you faithful and ready, he will have you recline at his table and he himself will serve his servants. Imagine the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the creator of this whole universe coming and serving you because you have served him here on earth and in heaven he will serve you. Even, on, even after the resurrection, we saw in John 21 that Jesus serves breakfast to them. Come and have breakfast, he says. Let's have this attitude. Let this mind be in you, it says in Philippians 2, verse 5, I think, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this attitude be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. The same condescending attitude Coming down to earth, not to be served, but to serve. Not to push people down, but to lift them up and to give them a helping hand and 
strengthen them, encourage them. May God help. Now, Brother Bhagiraj.